Joining me now is a Democrat from Illinois and a member of the House Intelligence Committee, Congressman Raja Krishnan Murthy. Uh, and uh, Congressman, thank you so much for being here. Obviously, you've seen the reporting on what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, they're forced to withdraw from the eastern city of Avdivka. How much responsibility do you and the rest of Congress bear for that city falling into Russian control? At least some responsibility, Ryan. Uh, I think the, the biggest problem that we see is that the Ukrainians don't have the artillery that they need to hold off the Russians at this point. By some estimates, the Russians are firing upwards of 10,000 artillery shells a day on the front, and the Ukrainians are firing about one-fifth of that, about 2,000 shells per day. So we're seeing a big mismatch, and it's going to only grow, and it's going to have some severe consequences. You know, it seems like at each stage of this war, there are these new uh, developments that happen, and the expectation would be that that would lead to some sort of change uh, in your colleagues that appear to be opposed to Ukraine funding. Do you think that perhaps this is the, the, the dam, uh, this would, could potentially break the dam, and when you come back, there's the opportunity that that supplemental bill will get to the floor and ultimately pass? Possibly. But I think what we're seeing is that Trumpism has infected the Republican House conference. We saw what Donald Trump did in tanking the border security bill, and now he and his allies are doing everything they can to prevent this aid bill from moving forward as well. Now, a number of my Republican colleagues, uh, of course, in the Senate bucked uh, this particular request and decided to pass it out of the Senate. The question is whether we can get enough of our Republican colleagues in the House to do the same, for instance, by adding their names to the discharge petition which now has roughly 210 to 215 signatures, needs more Republicans in order to get to the magic numbers. But if we can do that, then we can actually bring this bill for consideration on the floor. All right, let's turn to uh, another aspect uh, of what's happening with this threat from Russia. And I wanted to play uh, for you some of what Chairman Turner told Chris and Welker on Meet the Press yesterday about why he decided to raise an alarm last week about the national security threat related to a Russian space capability. Take a listen. The threat is very serious. Everyone who's looked at it uses the same language that, that I have, that it is a very serious threat. And I, I'm, very, I'm very glad that the administration is beginning to take action. Uh, we met with Jake Sullivan, and he began to lay out a plan uh, that hopefully would begin to address this. We need to make certain that we avert uh, what could be an international crisis. I was concerned that it appeared that the administration was sleepwalking into an international crisis. Uh, what is your reaction to the intelligence? Were you surprised the chairman uh, came out so publicly about his concerns? And were you concerned at all about how the administration was responding? Well, first of all, I was supportive of the chairman's decision to share the intelligence, the underlying intelligence reports with our fellow members so that they could make informed decisions about how they felt about the situation and engage accordingly. Um, I don't necessarily think that we should you know, be airing a public request to declassify the intelligence. Um, so I, in that regard, I disagree. But overall, I think with regard to the administration's response, I'm glad that they are formulating plans to deal with this uh, anti-satellite um, capability. And most importantly, they're engaging our partners, friends, and allies. Uh, I think they did this in Munich. And they're also talking to China and others who would be equally adversely affected were this capability to materialize. You're also the ranking member of the, the China Select Committee, uh, so you're an interesting person to talk about uh, in this space. So if Russia's developing an anti-satellite capability, is there the possibility that China's also working toward a similar wet weapon system? Should that also uh, be something we could be concerned about? And could it spark another arms race? I can't get into classified information but we should be equally concerned about any other country, whether it's China or others, developing anti-satellite capabilities, um, because you're exactly right. We're going to start an arms race in space, and that would um, you know, disrupt the way that we've been thinking about space for many years. And although at this time that anti-satellite capability is mainly kind of directed at satellites and not at humans on Earth or property on Earth, you could see a day where that changes, and that would, again, uh, change our whole understanding about deterrence. And, uh, you know, it basically 
creates a more unstable situation, much more unstable than we have right now. I want to get you to weigh in now on uh, some comments made by your colleague, Rashida Tlaib. Uh, she's urging Democrats in Michigan to vote against President Biden in the primary. The, the goal here would be uh, to raise her concerns about the situation uh, with Palestinians uh, in Gaza. Uh, what is your response to the congresswoman? Do you think that this is the right tack to get the administration's attention to the humanitarian crisis there? I respectfully disagree. I think that President Biden... Uh, needs all of our support because re remember, what is the alternative? Donald Trump is a horrible al alternative on so many levels, whether it's with regard to the Middle East or whether it's with regard to our democracy. So the stakes could not be higher. We need to stand with him and make sure that even as we try to harmonize our own internal differences of opinion with regard to policy and make sure that we uh, kind of go in the same direction, so to speak, uh, that we not give Donald Trump any space to take advantage of the situation and gain an edge on us politically. Obviously, you know uh, about how Michigan has a very significant Muslim American population that is very frustrated about what's happening in the Middle East right now. What can President Biden do to mend this rift with the more progressive wing of the party who are upset with the way this war is playing out? I think they want to see outcomes right now more than anything else, more than talk or more than any speeches could possibly assuage their concerns. And I think the Biden administration is working tirelessly right now to bring a, a pause in hostilities, a humanitarian ceasefire, a truce, whatever you want to call it, because that's essential for various reasons. One, we have to have the hostages released. And two, uh, we have to have humanitarian aid in much greater quantities flowing into Gaza to help people there. At the same time, I'm very glad that the Biden administration, working with others in the region, is talking about the two-state solution, which me and others have been spearheading as being equally important to anything else that we're talking about on the ground today. Mm -hmm. Because if there's not a light at the end of the tunnel where the Palestinian, Palestinians are able to govern themselves, in an independent state, then we're going to just see an endless cycle of violence, and that's completely unacceptable. And then finally, I need to get you on this topic uh, because you've been so outspoken about the security risks associated with TikTok. And the Biden campaign took a little while, but they did finally join that platform as an effort to try and, and connect with younger voters. I mean, how comfortable are you with the president and his campaign being on TikTok? I'm not going to tell the president how to communicate. Um, that's uh, not my purview. But I don't personally have a TikTok account, uh, either on my government device, which is, by the way, it's prohibited for all members of Congress, um, but also on my personal device. And the reason is very simple. TikTok is owned by a company called ByteDance. ByteDance is a PRC-based company, which is beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. And in repeated hearings now, under sworn testimony, We've heard various officials of the government and otherwise explain to us how China-based employees are able to both manipulate the algorithm underlying TikTok and also to access U.S. user data uh, in ways that uh, go against what TikTok says is even possible now. Mm -hmm. And that's why, at the end of the day, Chris Ray has said that TikTok screams out with, quote-unquote, national security concerns. And so... Um, I'm going to continue to uh, look at the situation uh, very carefully um, and, and try to work on a bipartisan basis to deal with it. I mean, you're so outspoken about this, sir. I mean, is it a bit hypocritical for the president on one end to push for a ban on government uh, owned phones uh, and then at the same time extend he and his campaign out on this platform? Well, I think that it's one thing to ban it on our government devices. Um, I think it's another thing to do it on a personal device or a campaign device. But at the end of the day, I'd like to give the, the Biden administration the authorities through legislation to actually force a sale of TikTok. It, we don't want to see a ban of TikTok. I don't want to see it go, go, go dark. And heaven knows many of my young constituents uh, use it in so many ways, including for dance videos and the like. But... We just don't want TikTok to be owned by a company beholden to an adversarial regime. Right. OK. Congressman Roger Christian Morthy, we got to a lot of topics, sir. I appreciate your patience with all of that. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it.